All right. Well, today, my delight is that we get to have a special conversation. Uh, my name is Scott Custer. I'm the lead pastor at International Church, and we get to be here with mm-hmm. Dr. Garrett Howegg, who is one of the members at our church and a doctor here in Hawaii. And we have a special guest, Dr. John Sanford, with us. Uh, Dr. Sanford, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are uh, and a little of your background. Okay. So I am a geneticist. And I was a Cornell research scientist for most of my adult life. And my area, my initial focus was on feeding a hungry world. That was my mission in life. And I, you know, that was my goal from undergraduate school on. I was involved in uh, improving crops, like improving corn crops and soybean and these things. Because uh, at that time, there was grave concern about mass starvation in the world. And there was a realization that we needed to greatly increase food supply to feed a hungry world. I started out uh, trained as a plant breeder, so I was doing artificial selection. We were improving a variety of crops through that conventional method. And then uh, not long after I became a, a new Cornell professor, the genetic engineering field was opening up. And so one of the things that was um, holding it back was that the big agribusiness companies um, were very keen to insert certain genes into certain crop plants, which would be extremely beneficial, that would you know, eliminate the need for pesticides or eliminate the need for harmful herbicides. But they were stuck because they couldn't figure out how to get the DNA into the cell so that they could do, you know, make a transgenic crop. My colleagues and I developed a technology called the gene gun, and that we used actually microscopic bullets, little tiny uh, tungsten bullets, and shot them in with a type of a gun so that the particles would, could carry DNA into the cell. They'd actually penetrate into the cell and deliver DNA into the cell. And so that method, we called it the biolistic method of gene transfer, but uh, it was more commonly known as the gene gun. And so the gene gun was my most famous invention that gave me international notoriety in the area of genetic engineering. Dr. Sanford, what would happen if I shot Pastor Custer with a gene gun? Let's try that out. I, I, <laughs> that I brought a gene gun. Awesome. <laughs> Ow. Uh, you, all you have to do is roll up your <laughs> sleeves and actually... So the gene gun was developed for a plant gene transformation. Okay, so I can't shoot my brother and well, mutate him into it. But another. actually later it was used for medical research. And so they were very close to having it as what a genetic vaccine that would deliver a puff of a blast of air would carry these microscopic particles into the skin and induce a, a vaccine response. So, so yeah, it was definitely uh, instrumental in the early stages of plant genetic engineering. But it was also a really hot topic for research in terms of a new way to uh, have vaccination. That's amazing. So basically, world hunger now is just a problem of resource management or political political systems. It's not actually a production problem anymore. Right. So basically, the, the starvation that's happening is usually because there's a war going on or a government that's, you know, robbing the people of, of their resources. So we have greatly increased uh, food supply since since when I was a young Cornell professor. And is this all over the world? Is this in poor countries? You work it's, in it's, Africa and Asia, everywhere? So I only worked in our lab, but the technology was embraced by the big corporations. And so this is these transgenic crops are global. Uh, for example, the papaya, most of the papaya here in Hawaii is transgenic. Uh, so it, there was a very serious virus disease that was destroying the papayas. And so basically a gene was inserted into papayas using the gene gun that made the plants resistant to that virus. So these are genetically modified organisms, or people call them GMOs. Yep, that's right. But a lot of people are afraid of GMOs. I was looking for you know food or different things without GMOs. You know, GMO free. I see that on different foods and, and bottles. Right. So it's become a political football. But actually, the the transgenic crops that were developed uh, were extremely beneficial. They reduced pesticide use. They reduced herbicide use, and they uh, increased yields. So they were very beneficial. So genetically modified, even when we were doing just conventional plant breeding using artificial selection, that's modified. 
So people are really confused about what GMO actually means, but the people shouldn't be afraid. The one thing, actually, may I interject, is that people are now making GMO people. So in China, they recently genetically altered two babies when, when they were at the zygotic stage. And so there were twins that were created that had a new gene integrated into them. So what's interesting to me is people are really worried about transgenic, um, let's say, corn, which is still just corn. Mm-hmm. But they're not too concerned about messing with human beings, which is where I am most alarmed. I'm really alarmed with the idea of GMO babies. And uh, technology is rapidly developing for that to become uh, widespread. I was just wondering, people are fascinated by genetics. They get these, they send off these kits to know their ancestry, to know their heritage. You know, uh, we get paternity tests and it's so precise. It's so accurate. People that are saying, I, I don't know who my father is. We, we rely on the court system. Mm-hmm. So there's this precision of truth inside our chromosomes. Why do you think people are fascinated to know who they are, their identity? Genetics is incredibly powerful new technology, including the ancestry stuff where you can discover uh, who you're related to and who, whether you were related to George Washington or Charlemagne or whoever. That's all. That's unfolding and it's fascinating. But I think a big part of it is people, because they think of themselves as animals, they think of themselves also as a genetic entity. So I am my genes and I am my mutations. But you see, the truth is, I am not an animal, I am not my body, and I am not my mutations. And it doesn't matter if I have genes that came from George Washington, it doesn't change who I am. So, so it is an identity issue. And so people who want to find out they're related to some famous person, and that's their goal, they, ha- they have to understand that for every famous person, good person that they're related to, they have a whole lot of villains in their the same lineages. So. <laughs> That fascination is kind of superficial. There's two things that everyone should know about genetics. First of all, we are programmed. We're genetically programmed to be human beings, and every cell in our body is programmed to be a human cell, which has a specific purpose, such as being part of the brain or part of the eyes or part of the blood system. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's like amazing, and life is programmed to be, make us who we are. Overlaying that is that we have been accumulating deleterious mutations, harmful, basically um, typographical errors in our genome. And that genetic damage is uh, transmitted from parent to child. And so even as we're fearfully and wonderful made, we're also degenerating. And that's really distressing, but, but very clear. Very so let me get happening. this straight. Let me get this straight. You, you, you wrote this book, Genetic Entropy. And if I could summarize, I... I I'm just uh, getting this all together, but that genes decay from mutations. These mutations are passed on and biological function declines, and which is evidence with our illness and our death, both individually and as the human species as a whole. Is that an idea that uh, is... So, so, yeah, so you really hit the nail on the head. There's two things happening. Personally, we're genetically degenerating. So... Uh, we, we now know that there's about three new mutations every time we have a cell division. So when we were a zygote, that first division of the zygote, both of the daughter cells have three new mutations. So we're worried about genetically modifying things, but our genes are modifying themselves constantly? Right. They're modifying themselves in the, way, in the sense of breaking down. So basically, there's three mutations for every cell division. By your time you're a teenager, every cell in your body has thousands of mutations that weren't there when you were conceived. And by the time you're my age, you have about forty to 50,000 mutations in every cell. It's now well known that the primary reason we age and die as we mutate to death. We accumulate these mutations over time, and so uh, we rust out a lot like a, a car would rust out. Wait a minute, what? Dr. Sanford. You're blowing my mind here because everything I've been taught is evolutionary theory would say that the, the mutations improve the existing organisms, that, that it actually creates new species. Uh, you know, what are you saying? That, that we're going down? Okay, so... Uh, All things go down apart from intelligent design. And so that includes our genomes. We are degenerating, and and it's because of this mutation problem. Mutations are deadly, 
and they keep pouring into the genome and accumulating. The other day, someone told me, hey, John, uh, you don't seem like yourself today. And I said, you're right. I'm considerably more mutant than I was <laughs> yesterday. And so I have trillions of cells, and each one of those cells are accumulating more and more mutations. And so it's, uh, it's why we age and die. And if we could stop mutations, we could live for hundreds of years. I'm a big fan of, uh, of superhero movies. Uh, mm-hmm. And I feel like for most of them, the origin story has something to do with genetic mutation. You know, they got bit by a radioactive spider mm-hmm. and changed the, the genes. So, you know, some of these mutations that are happening, you know, some of them could be good, right? Like maybe somebody won't get older and die. Maybe somebody will get faster or, mm-hmm. you know, incredibly strong. Is that possible as these genes change and mutate? So uh, the best way to understand uh, the nature of mutations is that they're like typographical errors in the text. So let's suppose you're transcribing someone else's document and you're typing away. You're going to make mistakes. Those mistakes are uh, genetic mutations in the genome. So the, the genome is made up of four letters, A, T, C, and G. And so literally you're changing letters. If you have a, let's say you have an instruction manual how to build a car and you have this big, you know, many volumes of text to tell you how to do that, what's the probability that if you introduce a typographical error, you're going to make the car better in the instruction manner? So basically, all typographical errors are very consistently deleterious. It's so rare for a random error to actually improve a text that it's, it's ridiculous to even think about. Now, yes, you could have a beneficial and it could actually improve a text, and maybe one, one out of a million times that might happen. But it doesn't help much because for every good mutation that arises, thousands or perhaps over a million bad mutations happen. Which so, is consistent with what I see. I mean, I never read the newspaper and hear of a woman born in rural China that has a mutation that allows her to run the 100-meter dash in three seconds. But I constantly see, even in my own practice, I see increasing rising levels of autism, schizophrenia, metabolic disorders like glucose, gluten and and lactose intolerance or autoimmune disorders. Is that kind of getting at that? So we made a, a jump a few minutes ago where we went from the individual to the population. And so this process of mutation that causes us personally to die is one aspect of genetic entropy. And it's something no no scientist would question that we, we die because of these accumulated mutations. But then because these mutations can be transmitted to the next generation, now we're talking about the well-being of a whole population, not just individuals. There are clearly, well, let me, let me put it this way, there are about 100 new mutations per person per generation. In other words, my parents gave me my genes so you already had all of their mutations and their grandparents' mutations, right? So, right? Like those so, stayed in there. That's right. So I inherited all of my ancestors' mutations. And then when I was conceived, I started to add my own mutations to that. So now I have a- about 100 more mutations that weren't in my parents. And my children have 100 more mutations than I have. And my grandchildren have 100 more mutations than my children have. So every generation is more mutant. The rate of accumulation is rapid, more than 100 mutations per person, per generation. So basically, every generation is inferior to the previous generation. This is not evolution. This is de-evolution. And the logic of it is very strong. So it sounds like the genetic entropy makes the argument, your book makes the argument, that instead of following evolution's right. line that we're going from nothing from you know a bad situation to better and improvement right. you know the, the arrows pointing upward toward a greater complexity and improvement sounds like you're saying the data you have found is no the opposite is true if what we call now is good it's actually getting worse right and so when i was an atheist and when i was a ardent evolutionist i was certain that everything was getting going up I held that belief. I didn't hadn't examined the issue. I just held it because I was taught it, and it was everybody I knew agreed that that's true. Where everything's evolving, and when I actually started to examine the problem of deleterious mutations, I realized that not only uh, are we going down, not up, but there are many high-level scientists who agree. So, for example, Alex Kondrashoff. He was at Cornell for a while. I had some interesting conversations with him, and he wrote a technical paper called Why Aren't We Dead 100 Times Over? 
and he was addressing the issue of how could we survive in deep time if we're accumulating mutations at a high rate much faster than natural selection can remove them. And his, his conclusion was it's not clear that there's any way. He basically is, is puzzled by it. So he ends up with the question, how could this be? How could we, why aren't we dead? And the answer is, uh, from a Christian or a biblical point of view, is uh, we're not dead yet because we aren't that old. The human race isn't that old, and the world isn't that old. Oh, wait, okay. slow that down, yeah. Yeah, okay, let me, let me break this down. So what you're saying, no, science doesn't say anything. Scientists say something about the data. And, and when two independent scientists study the data, study the research, and they reach the same conclusion independently. That's a, that's a pretty powerful point there. Now, Dr. Sanford, you're going up against a big institution of evolutionary biologists. And what you're confronting them with is, is basically crumbling the whole idea of, of evolution. Now, it can be powerfully confirming when two independent uh, scientists reach the same conclusion. So you're saying Alexei Kondrashov, author of uh, Crumbling Genome, mm -hmm. came to the same conclusion as you did. He, he did, and that's, he, he remains a committed evolutionist. Does that mean he's an atheist? Um, I, I, I don't know what his perspective is on faith, but, um, but I know that he uh, still defends evolution, so he's certain it's true. But his own research makes it almost seem impossible. It's not just him. It's it's there's a um, but there's a certain cognitive dissonance in that. How how do you how do you rationally logically manage that? Uh, I think that the way that evolutionists manage this, because they all are aware of this issue, uh, is that they say, "Well, we we don't understand it, but eventually we'll figure it out." Certainly, it's a faith-based. It's kind of a faith-based position. But certainly, they've got to pull out some examples of new organisms coming from old organisms. Okay, I, I look at the textbooks every once in a while. It's been a long time since I've been there, mm -hmm. over twenty years. But, but I was shocked to see the same examples of Plasmidium uh, falciparum, uh, you know, malaria with sickle cell anemia as as one of the cited examples of evolution or bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Aren't these just busted genes? So, so that example is really interesting because if you ask anyone, on the, any biologist, of, for an example of a beneficial mutation, they'll always say uh, the sickle cell anemia <coughs> mutation. And of course, that causes sickle cell anemia, which is a uh, semi-lethal or lethal um, mutation. And so, so is this something that's happened in humans? So some humans have... Right, right. So basically, people who have the mutation that causes sickle cell anemia have a broken gene, which makes a protein, broken protein. The broken hemoglobin pro protein then causes deformed red blood cells. The, the red blood cells that are deformed tend to clot, and they tend to uh, lead to inadequate oxygen, uh, you know, oxygen supply. And so it causes an anemia, which can and if you have two doses of that gene, if you get it both from mom and from dad, you will you will die prematurely. John, uh, I've been to Africa with my wife. I've seen people with sickle cell anemia lying uh, helpless. This is not good. You don't want that mutation. That that is not an improvement in the human genome. So so it's 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 if it wasn't tragic, it would be funny because uh, this is clearly a, a, a loss of biological information. It's due to a deleterious mutation. And so why are people calling it beneficial? <laughs> and so here's the reason. If you have a messed up red blood cell, if you, if you have all of the broken gene, the broken protein, and a broken cell type, and your, your red blood cells are so defective that the malarial parasite, which lives in the red blood cell, can't really thrive in that person. And so that person has even though they have a terrible disease that's due to a deleterious mutation, they are more resistant to malaria. So in areas where malaria is severe, this is a type of strange type of blessing in that you're sick due to the disease, but, at least, but you're so sick that the parasite doesn't want to infest you. 
you used the analogy of a of an instruction manual for a car earlier. I, f- mm-hmm. I found that helpful. It, so in this sense, somebody's instruction manual is so broken that let's say that that fourth wheel isn't being made, but it's okay because some of them, a, a very small number of people, only need three wheels in their very specific instance. It's actually beneficial for most of us. Three wheels is not better than four, but for a very small mm-hmm. number of popu- of the population, it is. About how many people is that? So, and, so and did I get that yes, analogy yeah, right, you, or is you, that analogy terrible? Well, it's pretty good, except a wheel is pretty fundamental. So most adaptive mutations are what are called reductive. That is, it involves a broken gene or a dysfunctional protein. And you go, how can that be beneficial? Well, sometimes if you have an artificial environment, you don't need that gene. And so by silencing it or eliminating it, it's like getting rid of dead weight in your car. If you take out all the, the back seat and all the unnecessary parts from your car, you can get better mileage. Have you advanced the car? No, you've actually reduced it. It has less function. But it has this but, one benefit. But, but but in the very artificial sense, you can say, oh, I see a benefit. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is blowing my mind. Now, Dr. Stanford, I've heard the work of this Dr. Linsky, and he's uh, growing generations of bacteria and looking at what happens over long periods of time because every evolutionist that I talk to say, oh, give me enough time, random, you know, random mutations, natural selection, it's going to, it's going to improve. Poof, there comes a new organism. Can you explain what Dr. Linsky's lab is finding? Because uh, f- from what I can tell, it's uh, these, these bacteria cultures just uh, can't metabolize certain sh- sugars or they lose mobility. What is this all about? Well, Dr. Lenski started this experiment decades ago, and it was a great experiment. It still is a great experiment. And it asked the question, can we see evolution happening? And because bacteria have a short generation time, you can have multiple generations in a single day, you can look, watch to see if there's evolution happening in real time. So this is observational science. This yes. is a big jump. Yes. This is this is not theoretical. This is not historical forensic activity. This is experimental bench lab observational science. Right. Dr. Lenski's experiment, he had a whole a lot of funding and he had a, a host of graduate students to do the work, but basically he took a single uh, strain of bacteria, grew it in 12 different flasks, and every day would transfer each flask to a new flask. And so he had 12 different lineages coming out, and then he could, they could watch to see how they changed over time compared to the original strain, which was kept in the freezer. Um, so they're measuring mutations So, so what's so, changing, how much is it changing, how fast is it changing? Yeah, when they started, they didn't have the sequencing, tech, DNA sequencing, so they were just looking at function. And they asked, over time, growing in this artificial environment with the artificial medium, are they going to grow faster, which would be evidence of improvement. And sure enough, they did see that all of the strains were starting to grow faster. And this was really exciting, and they were saying, this is proof of evolution right before our own eyes. But later, when the uh, DNA sequencing technology became available, they sequenced all their strains. And what they discovered was they could actually identify where the mutations had happened and which mutations had caused them to go faster, and which mutations didn't. What they discovered was, in every case, when they studied the mutations that had made them grow faster, they were, what we like I said, reductive in nature. In other words, in every case, either the gene was deleted or broken or downregulated or in some other way eliminated. And it's a little bit like you know jettisoning things from your car to make get better mileage. Necessary functions, functions that are necessary in the natural environment, weren't needed in an artificial flask. The bacteria, so the conditions were as perfect as they could make them, as beneficial as could be. And, and so the best way to speed up growth is to, is to jettison all unnecessary um, genes and proteins because they cost, they cost a certain amount of energy they, uh, and they slow things down. They're, they're necessary and beneficial in the real world, in the artificial environment, uh, you can get rid of those, and it looks like they're improved. But actually, those strains that were improved, grew faster in the artificial media, couldn't survive in, in nature. Most of our mutations are subtle. Because we have 3 billion letters in our DNA, 
shifting uh, three of them around isn't that big of a deal. That's right. And so, but it's like the rusting of an automobile. And so most mutations, uh, we can tolerate them, but, they are, but it still causes a subtle decline. With many mutations over much time, it's, uh, the, the end is very clear. So let me just try to sum up or, or turn, turn this a little bit. Uh, we've been talking about the problem of degeneration, and it's pretty depressing. From a Christian point of view, the key element here is to understand that our hope is not in this body or in this world. Our hope is in heaven, and that there's no technology that's going to reverse this. This is the nature of the, the degeneration of the genome is it's not fixable. And so that's really important to realize. It helps us focus our, our eyes on what really matters. But also, now let's, let's look at, uh, run, run the video backwards. If we are highly mutant, then in the past, people should have been less mutant. And at some point, there should have been people with no mutations. And so not only does genetic entropy, the, the reality of genetic entropy, disprove evolution, it makes evolution impossible because it's always going down, not up. The, t the net effect, even if there's a few beneficials, it's going down, not up. But to my great surprise, because I really just wanted to deal with evolution and show that it's not credible, but what I realized was that my research shows that there's a literal Adam and Eve who had no, no mutations. They were created without mutation and that they give rise to humanity as we see it. So it turns out genetic entropy affirms scripture at many levels. For example, if you look at the age of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, it gives us how old they were when they died. The first 25 generations from Adam to Moses are recorded. So-and-so lived so many years and then he died. And what it shows is that people used to live for over 900 years old, like Adam was 950. But at the time of Noah, lifespans began to decline rapidly, and you get this incredible biological decay curve. When you plot the scientific data that's in the Bible, the Bible has scientific data on the longevity of the patriarchs. It gives you a perfect curve, biological decay curve, and it shows very strong evidence that man has been degenerating since the beginning. Wow. You initially wrote this book talking about the human genome and how genes, uh, genetic mutations are overwhelmingly deleterious, so they're negative, things aren't getting better, humans are falling apart, our genome's falling apart. Uh, and as you thought this was primarily an argument against evolution, what you're finding is that it's also an argument for biblical creationism, yeah. uh, at least, at the very least, a, a young humanity. Am I understanding that right? Right. right. So it's, basically that's, and it's, uh, it's mind blowing. Um, it's like a gift from God. I, you know, I, I feel that our faith has been under attack, intense attack from almost every direction. And it feels like God is giving us evidences by his grace. So you're saying you can actually lean into this as truth. You, you mentioned that perfect fit to the biological decay curve. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, that if you have a perfect genome at the beginning created in Adam, there is no problem, you know, when, when you have cousins and sisters marrying, sisters and brothers marrying, because there's no mutations coming out, there's no inbreeding with a perfect genome. I've never heard that. Isn't that crazy? That blows my mind. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, this has been held up as a supposed problem. You can't have the human race come from two people because you'd immediately have these serious inbreeding problems. But if you start out without inbreeding, basically exposes the hidden mutations, the recessive mutations. But if there are no mutations, there's no deleterious effect from close intermarriage. Mm. And since uh, there was no one else to marry and God said, go multiply, it's pretty clear that not only was it permissible by God, but required by God, and in fact was not a genetic problem because there were not any mutations yet. So based on the current mutation rate, if we assume it, this was, you know, it, it followed that same decay rate that you've observed before, how far back are we talking? Like how, how many human generations based on the mutations? What would the math say there? Some of the leading geneticists who are evolutionists say we're degenerating at one to three or one to five percent per generation. If you plot that out, basically you're approaching extinction in just a few hundred generations. Wow. And so the biblical... So my kids are, are one to five percent less viable 
than I am. That's what that's what and they're my saying. My grandkids could be up to ten percent. So, so the evolutionists who are saying that are actually more pessimistic than I am. But, but yes, basically, there's wide, pretty much universal acceptance among medical or human geneticists that the human race is degenerating. So, so are the geneticists Park. just ignored? Because why, why is the evolutionary theory still so prevalent, so upheld, That's that no, humans are getting better? Does, is nobody listening to geneticists? The geneticists have a, uh, they add a caveat, which is, well, we take care of the sick and the weak. If we stop doing that, then we'd, natural selection would be more powerful and it could get rid of the mutations. Now, that's not correct. Number one, it's not humane, but it also doesn't work. If mutations are pouring into the human population, 100 mutations per person per generation, uh, there's no selection scheme, no matter how intense the selection, that can get rid of mutations as fast as they're pouring into the population. Uh, one of the limits of natural selection is it, you can only select away the surplus population. Like if you have um, a population size, you need s extra children so that certain, the inferior ones, can be selected away from a Darwinian point of view. So you can only select away a few individuals or only a small fraction of the population every generation, or the population will start to shrink and go extinct. Because we're not like bacteria, we don't have 64,000 right. uh, you know, children. <laughs> but this begs the question, how much longer do we have? I mean, we're just ballparking 300 generations, 20 years, let's say, for human, 6,000 years. Where are we at? Where, where are we at in this fitness curve on the biological decay? As, as you approach a thrush, uh, you know, as you have a curve that's going down like this, as it approaches zero, it tends to level out. And so I think that we're certainly not degenerating as fast as we were after Noah. Okay. But we do see you know, really some really disturbing things. We're seeing a lot of autoimmune disease. We're seeing autism. We're seeing a lot of genetic defects that are arising at alarming rates. And so one does have to wonder just how fast we are degenerating. But from a Christian perspective, we won't go extinct because Jesus will return before that day. So everyone Amen. wants to know, when will we go extinct? And the answer is never but the time will come for judgment. Amen. Uh -huh. And that things are going to slide continually, at least in, in terms of biological function, and things are going to keep sliding toward decay, however, it, until right. Jesus comes back and intervenes. So a lot of people are thinking right now, well, actually, we're living longer than ever before. You guys must be wrong. But the reason we're living longer isn't because we're, our genes are getting better. It's because we have modern medicine, we have better nutrition, we have credible biotechnology. If you take away from Can I us... ask, what was the life expectancy maybe before modern medicine, a couple few hundred years ago, so, without all these interventions? Yeah. Where were we at? Like in the 40s, average life expectancy in the 40s. 40s. So two, 300 years ago, the average life expectancy was, man, if you can get to 40... Half of the people would die before they were 45. Oh. Garrett wouldn't be here right now. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Technology has bought us more time, but still the mutational load is not going away. It just keeps growing. That's a, a term that's widely used by people who are concerned about genetic mutation that leads to extinction of species is the, the load of mutations keeps growing heavier and heavier so that the species becomes more and more stressed it's so remarkable cars how, rusting out it's remarkable how accurate scripture is that with the rescue of modern medicine we're still only achieving the the maximal of maybe 120 years right so it's really interesting before the flood god said i will not uh, contend with the spirit of man forever the the limit of his days will be 120 years and that's Ironically, that's where, where it's plateaued right now, is a maximal length, maximum life expectancy is right around 120. The other thing that's interesting is that the early patriarchs were living really long. By the time of King David, he died of old age at 70, mm -hmm. which is about where we are mm -hmm. now with our technology. There's a beautiful um, graphic in your book that, that plots that, and the fitness to that curve is remarkable. It's astonishing how close... Mm -hmm of a fit to a biological decay curve it is. Yeah, it's stunning. If you go to logosra.org, you will see the data, the raw data from the Bible and how we plotted it. But it's amazingly strong scientific data coming straight out of the Bible. Who, who should read this book, Genetic Entropy? I think that most people would be fascinated. It's a lot of people who are non-technical will find parts of it easy and parts of it challenging. I would scan over the challenging parts 
but try to grasp the basic message, which is actually very simple. We're going down, not up. Wow. Now we're, we're talking about just how the genetic work that you have done over the last many decades is pointing us toward creation being a real thing, mm -hmm. that humans are young, several thousand mm -hmm. years old, not millions and years old, not mm -hmm. uh, evolved. But I have a question. I, I hear this maybe from other uh, Christians, especially those who are maybe younger, it's those who have grown up with the evolution textbooks, with the ape demand, mm -hmm. you know, walking. Does this really matter? Why should we worry as Christians about how old the earth is, about how old humans is? What if we just talk about Jesus? Why do we need to worry about creation in the age okay. of humanity? Okay, so that's a lot. I, I understand why people would like to set aside this issue because it's contentious. But it's very actually, unpopular. Very un And it's not cool. The thing is, it's very important. You know, Jesus died to take away our sins. Sins, that's not a popular term nowadays. People don't want to hear about sin. The origin of sin is recorded in Genesis. It has to do with the rebellion of angels and the rebellion of men against God. That rebellion is why there's death, suffering, and evil in the world today. The bad news is that we are sinners and that we live in a broken world. The good news is that God has sent his son Jesus to redeem us, and so he can make all things right in his own timing. If you want people to embrace the good news, they have to understand the bad news. The bad news is the reason Jesus died. Jesus died because the fall was real, because evil is real, because Satan is real, and he's rescued us from all that. And so that's incredibly good news. Here's one way I describe it. They say, well, let's just stick to the gospel. And I'd say, yes, let's stick to the gospel. But foundational to the gospel is Genesis, because that's where we learn about why there was sin in the first place and why Jesus had to die. So if you take away Genesis and creation and a fall, you take away sin, you take away the need for salvation, the, the need for saviors. Yeah, you know it's, saying? it's really yeah. profound. Yeah, so, yeah, there really is a big uh, difference whether you have creation or not. The other element to this is, is God good? People struggle with that because they get, look at, why does God allow all this suffering? Why does he allow good people to suffer? Why do babies die? And they shake their fist at God. And if you don't believe that there was a fall, if you are let's say, have a, a theistic evolution perspective, we would have to say that God is the author of death, God is the author of suffering, God is the author of diseases, God is the author of sin. Because if there wasn't a fall, if Satan isn't real, then the, everything that is in us is evolutionary reflexes. And so it, it changes the character of God because God says he is good. He says his creation is very good. And that perfect creation before the fall is a mirror of heaven. In other words, if you can't accept the paradise that came before the fall, on what basis do you have to expect a literal heaven? And so it's, it's, it has huge consequences to how we see God, heaven, and God's character. And it has huge consequences with the Word of God. If you're saying that God, the Word of God is God's revelation to us, but, but we're saying, but he didn't, but don't believe him when he talks about Genesis. Don't believe him when he talks about the flood. Don't believe him when he talks about the fall. It means that Scripture is not actually trustworthy. And also it means that God isn't honest, because if he did it by evolution, why wouldn't he have said that? The, the ancient people, they could have easily grasped that. And since the Bible was written for all of humanity, and most of humanity is alive today, he would have said, oh, by the way, I did it by morphing one thing into another. It would have been very easy for God. Why wouldn't he do that? Why wouldn't he tell us the truth about how he created? It basically undermines, again, not the character of God, but even his truthfulness of God. You know, Pastor Custer, I you're asking this really important question. Well, why why should we worry about evolution? Why not just focus on Jesus? I am a psychiatrist downtown, and I see people every day, adolescents coming that are studying at the top private schools in this state, and they are suicidal. They say, my science teacher has told me we are a random cosmic accident. We're the end result of an unguided process of mutations plus time. And 
I'm, I'm just an accident. I don't matter. And, and this, they, they think that, you know, they're alone in the universe. This has massive implications on their identity, on their purpose, on how they should treat others when they live out this theory of evolution and, and incorporate it into their philosophy of life. And, you know, I think there, as Dr. Sanford is pointing out, there's so much more hope in something that science is actually now pointing to be true, which is theism, creation. That's how we got here. Dr. Sanford, you said earlier that you used to be an atheist and an evolutionary mm-hmm. thinker. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about how did you change your mind? What led you to think differently about both science and faith? So when I was in middle school and high school, I loved science. I just absolutely loved it. And so my mom would bring home books for me to read, and I just was really into it. Problem was my science textbooks and the authors I was reading were arguing that science disproves the Bible and falsifies God. So uh, there's no need for God because not Mother Nature can do all the creating. But before I graduated from high school, I was a hardcore atheist. I hadn't heard the other side. Our family was nominally Christian, and I hadn't read the Bible, and no one was there to mentor me. So I just believed what I was taught, and that led to a logical conclusion of atheism. When I went to college, I was already really a lost soul and confused. Then that was a really dark place for me. I was an atheist, but I also was interested in alternative spiritualities. And so that's, that's actually, I think you'll find that a lot of people act like they're atheists, but they also want to dabble with the occult or they want to, um, you know, make up their own religion. And so that's... Uh, and that's so almost because you need that, right? I mean, there's right. is atheism truly livable? As you were saying earlier, uh, Garrett, that people can't live the reality of there is no God, there is no meaning, I am random, uh, I am I'm only here by chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's not a livable reality. Yeah. We No morality, no right and wrong, no God who has made us in his image to uh, for a purpose or to act a certain way. Well, then... There's no right and wrong. Yeah. You can do what you want. And that's just not livable for yeah. us. I had an interesting conversation with uh, someone in the next generation, and uh, he was uh, an atheist or had been an atheist. And he said, I have discovered that atheism is very bad for your mental health. And so <laughs> he was so he was struggling with, does he want to even live? Because atheism is so dark, so yeah. empty. And so the atheists do want to find some type of spirituality, but generally, if they're not ready to you know, receive Jesus as Lord, uh, they're going to choose some type of spirituality that makes no demands upon them, and that's popular. Mm-hmm. And so they, they don't have to be utterly discouraged about atheism because they have something to dabble with, but there's, but there's not um, a God who cares about us personally and who holds us accountable. You know, I I worked the first 10 years of my career, I worked in California Departments of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And I worked in level four prison seeing uh, the condemned, the people on death row. I got to look into the mind of people who have murdered. When I was studying this and looking into this, a quote by Jeffrey Dahmer really struck a chord with me. Mm. If a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution as truth, that we all just came from slime. When we died, that was it. There was nothing. I find this lie of Satan called evolution is damaging. It's destructive. It's time mm-hmm. to, to end this myth. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd add to that. Uh, Darwin was by far, there's no question about it, the greatest atheist maker who ever lived. Mm-hmm. And he created hundreds of millions of atheists, maybe billions. His impact was profound. He also introduced eugenics and he introduced other really dark, dark things. So Darwin is the father of evolution, and his example is, is a lesson to us all. So it's funny that you talk about Darwin because, you know, his sentinel work 
published in 1859. The, we, we know it as Origin of Species, but the, in t- the title in total is never quoted. It's Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. I was astounded to read in that his view on races of South Americans saying, oh, look at this inferior race here. This truly shows uh, the transition of, of man coming from, or even gender. He, he, you know, he espoused male was superior to women in every way. This was carried on in the aristocracy, in the class wars, in, in social Darwinism. To say aristocracy breed with the, the better looking and they're evolving into a better uh, species, a more suited species. And this led to all kinds of atrocities. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there was uh, aboriginals that were collected up and put on display between the 1870s, right after the publishing of this, between 1870s and 1930s, they were displayed like a, and called human zoo alongside of chimpanzees saying, See, there's the link. There's our ancestry link to, to apes. Is that accurate? Darwin planted the seeds of something that was devastating to humanity. And it's been well recorded, the historical links from Darwin to Hitler. The, the thoughts that Darwin had of superior races and uh, eugenics uh, directly led into Haeckel, who was a German evolutionist. He advanced the idea of superior races, which then gave rise to World War II and Hitler. And so there's a direct connection between Darwin and Hitler. Wow. And so the Holocaust is part of that. Yeah, not only Hitler, but Stalin. I actually recently read in a book uh, of a seminarian, a guy who uh, met Stalin when he also was in seminary. He was preparing to be a Russian Orthodox priest. And he said to this guy who wrote the book, going, hey, you know they're all lying to us, right? There's no such thing as a god. And the seminarian responds, what do you mean? And Stalin said, look, I have a book. I'll give it to you. It'll tell you where we really came from. It's called Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Yeah. And shortly after that, Stalin left uh, the seminary and went on to do what he did. Wow. Murdering over 20 million mm-hmm. uh, of his own people. That is my blind. So it really is. You are mm-hmm. very right. There is a direct philosophical connection from Charles Darwin, uh, intentional or not, it is there to mass atrocities uh, Mm -hmm. in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So isn't it true, too, uh, that uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, you know, Margaret Sanger went into and was saying natural selection isn't acting fast enough for these impoverished races and, and, and populations and bringing uh, abortion into these areas, uh, eugenics uh, that you just mentioned. I mean, this is artificial selection. This is a, a political system, governance coming against people to say, we need to eliminate this inferior race. Yeah, so that was, that, that was a dark his, part of American history, again, because uh, originally her, her, um, her organization wasn't called Planned Parenthood. It had... Uh, something to do with eugenics. I forget the, exactly what it was called. But she did, um, she was explicitly racist and she was explicitly for eugenics. She wanted to provide abortions and birth control for specifically for Afro-American communities. And she spoke of the superiority of races and the eventual desire to, to purify Uh, her race. So Darwin's legacy is devastating. Well, we thank you for the work that you're doing uh, to undo as much of that damage as Mm -hmm. possible. Thank you for the the years of research that Mm -hmm. you have been doing to unravel the misinformation around evolution. Mm -hmm. So thank you for writing your book, Genetic Entropy. If you are listening to this, I highly encourage you to pick it up. Uh, It is absolutely worth reading and understanding. It'll inform more of your scientific and faith background to understand Mm -hmm. where we came from and what the true answer is, Mm -hmm. and that it is a young humanity, several thousand years old and not millions of years. So pick up a copy of Genetic Entropy. Thank you so much for joining us with uh, Dr. Sanford. 
and Garrett Halweg, and I'm Scott Custer. All right, welcome to this episode of International Gathering. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at International Church here with uh, Dr. Garrett Halweg, a uh, psychiatrist here in Honolulu, and we have a special guest, Dr. John Sanford. Now, Dr. Sanford, you wrote a book called Genetic Entropy, which we've talked about before, which uh, proves evolution is false. But why do so many paleontologists and uh, paleoanthropologists, why do they point to the ape-human transitional bones as evidence that, hey, evolution is real? Look, look, we have transitional fossils. They're there. After writing the book Genetic Entropy, which is, you know, really, um, it was kind of a revelation to re-examine things I thought I understood and then realized that I was, as I looked deeper, that I was wrong and that, in fact, the story was actually much more interesting than people realize. I was getting feedback, well, you must be wrong because we have these transitional bones. So the fossil record clearly shows ape-to-man evolution. So whatever your genetics arguments might be, they just can't stand against the evidence of the fossil record. And so that caused my colleague and I to critically examine these claims of intermediate fossil types. Chris Roop uh, is the person who uh, did most of the research for the book Contested Bones. And together we pulled together all the information and basically presented it in a coherent way. The production of uh, Contested Bones was four to five years of intense work. We were really gratified when we were finally done with it. And we realized that people were reading it and finding it fascinating, and that it was enlightening people who had been taken captive by the, the standard hype of we find bones that are intermediate between man and ape. So the reason we spent those five years is because we wanted to show that not only does genetics show that we didn't evolve from ape, but also the fossils themselves speak of um, that man is distinctly different from the apes. Tell us a little bit about that. What was the, the process for examining the, the evidence? Maybe what is evolutionary's main argument about these fossils? And how did you come at that? As Chris delved deeply into the contemporary literature, the first thing we discovered was that the stuff that's produced for the mass audiences, like the Nova Specials and that sort of thing, National Geographic, those things are, are basically building a case for the traditional evolutionary perspective. Since all those people tend to believe that evolution is true, they build everything else around that foundational assumption. And so as we started to look through the literature, we were not assuming that evolution is true, and we were simply wanted to hear exactly what the people in the field were saying. And the reason we called it the book Contested Bones is the first thing we realized was that people in the field sharply disagreed on almost everything. Whereas what's presented is, oh, well, here's we exactly know exactly how it happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that's it's just as clear as day. Uh, you go behind the scenes at, and pull out, let's say, just quotes from people in their less guarded moments, and you realize that, that everything was is very contested, and in fact, the field is basically in disarray because every time they find a new skeleton, it turns the previous claims upside down. Mm. So, so there's not a lot of unanimous... Uh... No, it's not <laughs> unanimous. It's, it's just incredibly different points of view on every single one of the fossil types. And so it's just really intriguing that that's not more transparent, made more transparent to the public. Now, wait a minute. I've seen the March of Progress. I, I've seen that diagram that transitions from the ape to the human. You're telling me that these drawings weren't based on scientific evidence, that this is some artist's creativity or something? Yeah. So the ape parade is actually now universally rejected. This is one of the things that they can agree on, is that the ape parade doesn't reflect reality. And so that those beautiful, iconic images are so powerful visually, they almost prove it. You know, it's almost like you've, you've already, it's been proven before. Just when you look at that picture, you go, oh, well, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go from, a, from an ape-like creature to man. They just have to s straighten up and walk erect. Yeah. And then they're... I like the ones where they end back hunched over again over <laughs> a computer or a cell phone. Like, and now we're going back down. Yeah. So about 10% of our book is in blue. 
And blue is the text where we're quoting paleoanthropologists and what they actually are saying. So you guys just went out into the field and said, okay, this isn't maybe our area of expertise. We're going to go find the experts and find what they're saying. And what you're finding is they're saying lots of different things. Right. If you just delve into the literature, not the, not the popular media stuff, but the actual scientific literature, what you see is uh, things are contested. And the, the things that are in the textbook are already obsolete. And a lot of professors who are teaching paleoanthropology and they, what they learned is when they were graduate students is now totally obsolete. Could you give us an example of maybe you know something that was prevailing wisdom that paleoanthropologists go, hey, we told you all wrong, so sorry. When I was just a boy, ages ago, the prevailing view was that there were ape-like creatures and then there was a transitional form and the, 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 the transitional form was called Homo habilis, able man. And then that gave rise to modern man. So Homo habilis was considered a very important transitional form. The interesting thing is, how many skeletons did they find? Well, they found none. All they found were bits and pieces of, of bones scattered widely over a, an area. There is no Homo habilis skeleton. In fact, there's just bits and pieces. At that time, that was the only transitional form they had. And so they... they so so they, they just found like bits and pieces of a skeleton and just presumed upon the rest? Yes. Basically, you fill in the blanks with... Fill, out, fill in the missing uh, bones with your I think this bone went here. This one was probably a little bigger, smaller, uh, as needed to suit the theory. Right. So, so the people who were d- studying Homo habilis, that was the Leakey family, a very famous paleoanthropological family in the history of the field, they concluded that uh, they were seeing in the same strata, they were seeing human bones and ape bones and then these intermediate bones. The intermediate bones were so incomplete that you could have some human bones and some ape bones in the same skeleton. It was a mixture of, of bones and very incomplete. So the Leakeys, Mary Leakey in particular, after her husband had passed away, was saying, what we see here is transitional form, but then she she changed her mind and said, these are mixed bones. Over the decades, more and more paleoanthropologists have rejected Homo habilis. They're saying it's a what they call a wastebasket taxon, a taxonomic group where people would find bones that they couldn't classify as human or ape, and so they'd kind of throw them in the box and go kind of miscellaneous bones, and they called the miscellaneous bones Homo habilis. Okay. Okay, but wait a minute. Darwin himself said the fossil record does not reflect a record of transitional fossils, but was confident it would be found, but admitted if transitional fossils were never found, the evidence would show his theory of evolution was false. Dr. Sanford, you're telling me there are no transitional fossils? Evolutionists need transitional fossils, otherwise they're dead in the water. So they're always finding transitional fossils, but they don't ever hold up to scrutiny. That's, that's the problem. Stephen Jay Gould was one of the most famous scientists of my era, Harvard professor and you know, wrote many books and very popular author. He and one of his colleagues, Eldridge, wrote a paper which basically said, we can't find transitional forms. There's a complete absence of it. A transitional forms. So we, so evolution must happen when we're not looking. <laughs> and so, so, so because there's not millions, millions of transitional creatures between all kinds of species, right? Not just mm-hmm. humans, but let's just focus on humans and apes. Because there aren't, and we should expect to find lots. Yeah, so, they're so, doing it at night, or <laughs> so. So, so basically, they introduced the concept of punctuated equilibrium, where everything stays the same, and then suddenly, when you're not looking. It changes to Boom. something new, and of course, that's not a transitional form. That's just a story. It's storytelling. They were the first ones to kind of blow a whistle on their own field, and they said, "Really, we don't have evidence, and so we need this kind of fancy-sounding term, punctuated equilibrium, to explain why we don't really find evidence for the intermediates." So all of these bones were found to support a theory. So people who were enthusiastic about evolution, their dream was to go off in some remote area and find ape man bones. And so guess what? People did find bones and they called it every bone they found an ape man bone. 
they were usually very incomplete skeletons. So one of the first of those was a man named Du Bois who went off to Southeast Asia because back then uh, Darwin had thought maybe the orangutan was the missing link or the, the, the origin of man. Because orangutans are in Southeast Asia, they went there to find it, and they found some bones that were a little bit unusual, and they called it Homo erectus. But the bones showed pathology. In other words, they were atypical, but they were also diseased. And that's, as we talk about this more, we're going to see that that's a regular theme, is that a lot of the bones that are considered transitional forms are actually humans that have undergone inbreeding, people who are genetically compromised. And so because they're anomalous, they, they look like they're not quite human, but it's pathology, not a transitional form. How do we know it's a pathology? I mean, how would we know? Like, hey, this, this skeleton, something was wrong with this guy. Is it the DNA that they're examining? What? What leads us to that conclusion? There, there needs to be more DNA research done because those bones do have DNA in them. Surprisingly, it hasn't been done. Let me just give you an example. The hobbit. You maybe have heard of the hobbit. It's called uh, Australopithecus florensiensis. And so it's got a fancy name. It looks just like a small human being. But it has deformities, especially in the teeth and other parts of the skull. And because they're tiny and they're they're sickly, they're considered you know more like an intermediate between a smaller a smaller ape. But actually, the analysis is their actual skeleton structure is distinctly human. They can measure the the bumps inside the brain case and know what the brain what type of brain Hobbit man had, and it have, had a very human like brain. The Hobbit man is now widely considered a defective human being, but for for at least a decade, it was being treated as a missing link, a missing species, a subhuman. But Hobbit Man, which is an affectionate term for him, is he's just a tiny little human with deformities. And he, he's, he was on a small island called Island of Flores. And if you are, have a small population of people on a small island, they will inbreed, they will have show genetic degeneration, and they will grow smaller and more and more compromised. Okay, so there are other examples of that. Well, I, I, I just want to back up because I'm not a paleoanthropologist. So I, isn't this arbitrary? Like, um, you know, Native Americans, they lived alongside uh, European settlers with a very different footprint, but they lived contemporaneously. Is this basically what was done? Is this, they said, well, if, if they're buried in this, with these primitive tools, they were subhuman. Is that, am I getting this? It's a little more complex than that, but the, the best evidence is the actual anatomy of the bones. People try to make inferences from tools or other things, but like you say, uh, that, that's not the measure of man. Actually, tools are the measure of man. But let me try to clarify something. We mentioned that one of the first things we saw was that the Ape Man Parade is uh, rejected by everybody in the field, and now they call it a messy bush. They can't actually trace anything to anything. They're really uh, in a state of confusion about uh, how these different bones r relate. But, th but the one thing they can say is that there's two basic groups. The first group is homo, that is man, and then there are other bones that are called Australopithecus. Australopithecus is a long-sounding name but it, in Latin, but it means simply southern ape. So all the bones can be classified as either Australopithecus, southern ape, or human. That's really useful to explain to people who aren't familiar with the field is, okay, we have basically two types, and the question is, is there a bridge from the monkey-like creature to the man-like creature? And that's... That's very helpful. Yeah, that's what's and, missing. And you're a geneticist. And so, <clears throat> you know, this is a forensic activity that they're looking at the morphology and trying to determine... Is this an ape? Is this a man? Is this a transition? But you look at genetics. So in terms of chromosomes, how many chromosomes does an ape have? An ape has 48 chromosomes. We have 46. So essentially, genetically, if you look at the, the DNA, let's say, of Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, <clears throat> or, or these others, genetically, maybe a better measure is can they interbreed? Is that something? Is that an idea? Um, so interbreeding is a is a is a measure of 
uh, the same kind or the same species. We do know that, for example, Neanderthal interbred with Europeans, and now they found actually Neanderthal DNA in Africans too. So the Neanderthals were contemporary with human beings, and they intermated, and so now we have, some of our DNA comes from Neanderthal. Each, everybody in this room has Neanderthal genes. And so there's, there's no question that Neanderthal was one of the missing links. It was, in the first Neanderthal skeleton was found during Darwin's era, and, um, and so a lot of people wanted to classify Neanderthal as subhuman, and so the early cartoon versions of Neanderthal was very ape-like. And as they found more skeletons, they found that Neanderthal was anatomically human. Uh, only, the only difference was a slightly different shape to the skull. You know, we have an egg-shaped skull like this, and the Neanderthal has a, the, like an egg laying down. And so they, they're longer this way, and we have more of a high forehead. But the, the brain volume is similar and the, the Neanderthals were unequivocally very human. They made beautiful artwork. They made flutes. They made um, jewelry. They planted their dead with uh, what are called um, grave goods, meaning valuable things were planted. So they clearly believed in the afterlife. So Neanderthal is a good example. It was the first supposed subhuman. Uh, it's now fully human. And there's no just, question. Just about like it. everybody else in his time just, and place. Yeah, right. So just different skull shape. Different, slightly different skull shape, but there are people alive today with the Neanderthal skull. So so yeah, basically Don't point don't point at people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, uh, Homo erectus, Homo hobbit, ha, hobbit uh, Naledi, they are anatomically modern humans with forty six chromosomes. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy. You know, Ardipithecus, uh, Ramidus. These are apes. Forty-eight chromosomes, like so. We can't. We, we, we don't have the the chromosome number for any of these fossils, okay. unfortunately. Okay. That would be really. I'd love to see that sequencing be Me done. Me too. But I think that's what we would see. So Neanderthal was the first supposed ape man, and that's been totally overturned. The next one that was found was Homo erectus by this guy Du Bois who went and found anomalous bones in Southeast Asia. And that was originally thought to be subhuman, but more and more now paleoanthropologists are classifying Homo erectus as modern man and not a different species, but with pathology. So there's two different things going on that give people the impression that they're missing links. The first one is... There are a number of important finds where they have actually ape and human bones jumbled together. Yeah, a lot of these sites were where they would go out and get meat animals, bring them back to a central location, and butcher them using stone tools. And so the throughout these, these deposits, there's lots of bones of the things they were eating. People even now eat, people in Africa even now will eat uh, chimpanzees or gorillas or any other or any other um, thing they can get their, uh, their hands on for meat. But there were clearly apes that were being eaten, but their bones ended up intermingled. Mm -hmm. So that's the first big point people should understand is, hey, these, these are separate bones, these are apes, and these are human bones, but they're being found together, right. in, so they're being assumed to so, go together. So, so it's really clear, and there are eight major types of bones that are considered transitional. Eight? The Neanderthal is one type. Oh, okay, Erectus okay. is another type. I mean, how many bones are we talking? If we were to pile them all together, yeah, we, like, we, I mean, we are we talking like semi-trailers and ships worth of bones? So, so Neanderthals uh, buried their dead in caves, so we have a lot of skeletons of Neanderthal, okay. and they're totally human. Uh, Erectus usually is not found in caves. Sometimes it is. But they're usually not as well preserved, and they're not as uh, frequent. They all consistently show pathology, consistent with a small tribe that's inbred. And there's a paper that just came out recently in the field, and it basically says wherever they find bones that are, that are considered old, they also see pathology in the bones, tons of pathology, pathology that can't be due to chance. In other words, people who are looking for intermediate forms pick up weird bones or don't look straightforward. So there was a lot of pathology early on, and those tribes 
not only were deformed and often very small, but they all went extinct. And so it's like a genetic entropy accelerated. If you have small populations that are in isolation, they will undergo rapid genetic entropic decay. But Dr. Sanford, we just learned in genetic entropy in discussing this that there, there should be billions of these. We should see them everywhere. We don't see them everywhere. They're extremely rare. Neanderthal is the exception, but Neanderthal is clearly human. Okay, so, so Neanderthal is off the table. We, we, we can discount that as a missing link. There's only one nearly complete erectus skeleton. Homo habilis, there's no skeleton. It's just bits and pieces. Sedaba, there's fragments. Erectus is now largely, many, many paleoanthropologists would say erectus is human. They're isolated tribes that degenerate. So if we were to summarize uh, maybe the main points of your book, Contested Bones, that, hey, these are the main couple takeaways for people. When somebody brings up transitional fossils or or that's something they're wondering about, uh, what would you give as a brief summary? What are the main things people should know? The bones are contested. The classic idea that we can actually trace the bones through a linear, you know, ape parade has been rejected. The messy bush is basically acknowledged. They use the term now widely. Everybody agrees it's a messy bush, meaning they can't figure out who led what creatures led to what creatures. So they don't have any way to connect the dots. There are two types, ape and human, and there's no intermediates. The, the claims of intermediates are due to either humans that have degenerated, genetic entropy, or mixtures of bones between ape and man found in the same strata. That's the bottom line. Uh, The last part, I think we're running out of time, and this this has been a difficult discussion because it's wonderfully complex. But but the bottom line is uh, the evolutionary perspective doesn't hold up. And... uh, it looks very clearly that apes and humans are separate groups. There's no evidence of clear transitional forms. And lastly, um, the humans, uh, although they were often experienced uh, degradation uh, due to, in isolated tribes, they're still clearly human, So there are, they, and they, they would have been able to intermate with every, any other human. And... Um, the, from a Christian point of view, from a biblical point of view, what people would ask, when did these un- unusual human bones arise? And the answer is that they must have come, if you have a biblical perspective, post-flood. And so they're quite young. They're young, uh, younger than Noah, younger than um, Abraham. So within the last wow. few thousand years. Yeah. Sure, yeah. And so basically... Most of these bones, we think, were deposited in the post-flood glacial period, the Ice Age. So all, the, all these bones are human, and, and so a similar idea would be dogs. Dogs could interbreed, and, and if we unearth the skull of, let's say, a pit bull versus a chihuahua, those would look very different, but in fact, they can interbreed, is that? So, so they're not all the same because we have the Australopith. Which is a which is an ape type, but when we talk about Homo, because so the paleoanthropologists talk about two groups, Australopithecus and Homo. All the Homo would be inner inner uh, could interbreed. They were all fully human. Some of them had pathologies, and so those pathologies make them look less than human. They are smaller and they have a, a less brain volume and they have all kinds of just like de- defects, and so um, so the Homo is is um, would be people descendants of Adam and Eve. All those different species, Homo naledi, which is the most recent one, Homo sediba, Homo uh, habilis, Homo erectus. All those um, are descendants of Adam and Eve. That's the bottom line, and some of them are pretty strange looking because of genetic. Entropy. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating. So when the Bible says that God made them all according to their kinds, that's what it means. They're, they're not transitioning from one to the other. The apes are apes. Humans are humans, a special creation right. made by God. Right. And the fossil record overall the, bears that out. Thanks for putting it in those simple terms. That That's that's good. Um, we had a lot of bunny trails this discussion, but that's the bottom line. 
Bottom line. Well, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Sanford. If you're listening, I encourage you to check out the book Contested Bones. If you're all interested in this, you will not regret it. Thanks so much for your time today. Hello. Uh, glad that you are with us today. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at International Church of Oahu, and we are here today with Dr. Garrett Halwig, a good friend of mine here in Honolulu as a psychiatrist, and we have Dr. John Sanford with us today. Now, uh, Dr. Sanford is the author of several books, and the one that we're talking about today is called The Sexual Holocaust, which he co-wrote with Bridget Heap. Uh, it, uh, it provides an overview of the sexual revolution and its harmful consequences, uh, kind of seen in uh, uh, viewing of sexuality today. Uh, Dr. Sanford, why don't you start by telling us, why did you write this book? So this book um, was uh, an unlikely book for me because I'm a geneticist and I do scientific research that helps give credibility to Scripture. And so people go, why are you doing this? It's because I really felt the, the Lord, it's a calling from the Lord. I heard several years back Josh McDowell present to a very large audience basically the state of pornographic phenomena in our culture. And what he basically did was outline that pornography is ubiquitous in our culture and that it's found in the church and outside the church and that it's devastating to people and it's affecting more and more children who are very young, even children under 10. When I heard that speech, I thought when he was done, what I felt was every we had to pray because I realized that this is devastating humanity. And, and of course, they just said, well, thanks, Josh, next speaker. And I go, wait, wait, this is, this is the most disturbing thing I could imagine, that all these people and all these children are being corrupted. And it became a very heavy burden on my heart. There were several starts and stops to kind of capture the urgency of the problem. There was a certain amount of, I think, spiritual warfare going on. It took quite a few years before we could actually pull this together. It was really spiritually charged. What I realized as we looked deeper and deeper into the problem is that this is what, what I, we're calling, number one, the title, sexual holocaust. Okay. People said you shouldn't use that word, holocaust. That's a very strong word. That's, people will be upset by that word. And I go, the nature of this is actually a young person who's caught up in this, uh, he said, you used exactly the right word. This is devastating the next generation. Mm -hmm. So this is a book that's very disturbing. It's basically something urgent. It's an urgent crisis, and we have a responsibility to respond to it. So why did you call it a holocaust? Like, why use that that word? That's so strong. You know, I, I just think Im images of, uh, you know, World War II and the Jewish holocaust or nuclear holocaust comes to my mind. Right. And so that's exactly right. Is This is arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis in history. And so people could say, oh, you're using hyperbole. No, I don't think so. The Jewish Holocaust was absolutely horrendous, just one of the most evil things that ever happened. And my heart goes out to the Jewish people. The sad thing was that the nations around Germany and even America ignored the Holocaust, and they, they wanted to think it was just hyperbole and it wasn't really happening. But of course it was happening, and there should have been intervention much earlier than what happened. Six million Jews, innocent Jewish people, were slaughtered ruthlessly by Hitler and his, his agents. We're not talking about millions of people, we're talking about billions of people being devastated. So there are seven to eight billion people in this world, and what we're gonna see as we look at this is a large part of those seven to eight billion people are being devastated by this crisis. Where do you see this crisis stemming from? Why is the alarm now so much worse? I mean, humans have been around for a long time. Sin, sexual sins, been around for a long time. What's making this crisis so much worse uh, right now? Where has it kind of started and come from in your perspective? Most of cultures through most of history have had uh, the nuclear family as a core of their social structure. And that social structure of family involved a certain amount of restraint and responsibility and a certain amount of power of social norms. There were periods of time, like the Roman Empire, where things were just really coming unglued and children were being abused and children were being thrown into the street who weren't perfectly formed, babies, where uh, just every type of sexual sin was going on. 
Uh, and there are cities like Sodom where the same thing was happening. After 2,000 years of Christian influence, humanity has, has developed some basic norms that are really important to protect children, to protect women, and protect people from their own sins. The bottom line is we have to deal with this problem. One way to illustrate how deep this problem runs is our humanity consists of our physical humanity, our emotional humanity, our social humanity, and our spiritual humanity. And the sexual holocaust is impacting all four levels of our humanness. Now, uh, you asked the question, where did this come from? The sexual revolution started about 100 years ago, mm -hmm. and the faith-based morality was decaying at the same time that people discovered contraception methods that were effective, and at the same time antibiotics were introduced. Sexually transmitted diseases have devastated humanity through time, and suddenly it looked like we could stop that, those diseases through, with antibiotics. The feminist movement was a big part of it, but the biggest part was the development of the internet. So that's, you know, just in the last few decades. The internet has totally eliminated any type of sexual restraint. There are many levels to the sexual holocaust, but they're all fueled by X-rated entertainment. So the, the sexual holocaust, the effects, uh, you say they're causing physical, emotional, social, and spiritual harm. Maybe let's take a little bit of time and, and look at each of those lenses. From your research, what, what are the physical effects that this kind of unmoored sexuality, this free love, this lack of, of restraint and boundaries, what physical harm is that having on us humans? Uh, let's start with pornography. Pornography isn't just entertainment. It's a powerfully addictive drug, and it impacts people in the most profound ways, even prepubescent children are infected in the same way. It affects the endorphins of the brain, and so basically it leads to addiction. Even before people reach addiction, their pornographic habits change how they see people of the opposite sex, how they see uh, relationships. It basically, relationships become loveless and just physical. Pornography is devastating for the users. We usually think of only men using pornography, but increasingly women are using pornography. It's bad for them in the first place. It's bad for their partners. It's bad for their relationships. But when it becomes addiction, it absolutely destroys their life. It's like alcohol or other hard drugs, is that it becomes all they think about and all they care about. And it's so it's truly destroying countless lives. In your book, you say that... Uh Stats show that 30% of all internet traffic is for pornography. As blew my mind, that 30% of that's, the internet and internet th usage. Th that's uh, an alarm that should, that you know, everybody should hear, hear that and go, Lord help us. Right. And, and, and that it's, it is primarily been billed as a, oh, this is an issue for guys and men, but one in four users more, uh, close to 30% now, is female uh, women logging on to, right. to view porn. And so the next generation, it's even more extreme, yeah. more, more like a half. Half of, of young girls, 12 to 17? The ones who are like are in the teens. That, wow. that, that's, um, it's, the, it's very much skewed toward young. So porn is extremely affecting a huge number of people. There are seven and a half billion people. Of those billions of people, several billion are using porn, maybe half, maybe three billion. And for addiction, at least one billion I've heard that in Western societies that as many as 90 to 95% of men within the last year have encountered sexually explicit images with intentionality, with, you know, with sought it, for it, sought it, sought it out. It out. Yeah. So basically, one of the numbers that I ran across that was very disturbing was for men over 25, and this, it's worse for the younger men, but for men over 25, only 10% do not seek it out. Wow. 10%. 10% of those 25 and older don't seek it out. Everyone else seeks it out, whether they seek it out daily, weekly, monthly. There's only 10% who don't seek it out. That talks about an impact on humanity that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. The most disturbing part of porn is that the most frequent users are teenagers. Whose brains are still developing, whose it's, everything, the bodies, and, 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 and so they use on right. the opposite gender and themselves. It, it impacts them profoundly. Even worse is the children under 10. 
there are statistics that indicate that 10% of all pornography is for children under 10. If you care about your children, if you care about your grandchildren, you need to care about this. That's the porn and addiction aspect. This uh, next one is STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. A lot of people are reckless. They don't realize that sexually transmitted diseases are, are very prominent and that if people who are being promiscuous are going to get STDs, half of the most common STDs are incurable. You will have that disease for the rest of your life. You will risk communicating it to your loved ones and your children. And so... STDs are a huge deal. The World Health Organization, their latest report for the year of 2018, they said there are over 1 billion people infected with STDs. What is the likelihood of somebody who is being promiscuous? You know, I, I think of like pictures of a college campus and kind of even just my own experience of having been on a college campus. It was rampant. Uh, right. Surprisingly, it's- I thought it was maybe just the movies portrayed it that way. It was happening. Yeah, it's it's happening. So the hookup culture is very real. Mm-hmm. There's no relationships. It's physical. It's twisted. We've been trying to figure out what number. We'd love to actually go around to the universities and ask their health clinics just how many of the kids have STDs. But we, we believe that during their four-year stay at undergraduate school, 25% of the kids get infected. People who are sleeping around are just uh, almost certainly going to develop one or more STDs. That's a huge physical harm. In terms of violence and abuse, the numbers suggest that uh, something like 35% of all women in the world have experienced sexual violence. There are numbers that suggest that one in four girls will be sexually abused before they're 18, and one in six boys. So we're talking about a large fraction of all children are being abused. Yeah, I have four girls. That's kind of stat that keeps me up at night. Right. You know, heaven help us. Yeah. I I was a youth pastor in my earlier days, and I had a video that I used to show to my group on occasion. It was an interview with uh, Ted Bundy, the serial rapist and murderer with Jim Dobson, Mm -hmm. the day before he was put to death. And in that interview, he says, one of the biggest kept secrets that nobody else is going to tell you is that what us murderers, all of us on death row have in common is a use of and fascination with pornography that all of us who are murdered do start with this, which blows my mind that it really does lead to violence and abuse for, or at least those who, who end up with violence and abuse start here. Yep. It's getting worse. Slavery and bondage, violence and abuse are the thing, impulsive things, but slavery and bondage is, are people who intentionally uh, entrap and control people as sex slaves or um, prostitutes. The average age for prostitution is something like 13 or 14 for girls when they start and like 11 to 12 for boys. So we're talking about systematic abuse of children for commercial gain Mm. that's uh, very large. So of all the physical harms, ubiquitous abortion is a special place. Okay, so abortion, is that part of this story. It is because the sexual holocaust is unrestrained sexuality. Sexuality that's irresponsible and uncontrolled. That's what essence of the sexual holocaust is. And abortions are due to, for the most part, irresponsible sexual behavior. About what percentage are? Because I I hear people say, well, we need to protect abortions for women because, you know, those who are rape and incest, they you know, this has to be a, a humane way for them to end the pregnancy. But you're saying the vast majority aren't even... In- no, the vast majority them. are due to uh, bad decisions and lack of uh, responsible behavior. So there are something like a very tiny fraction of abortions are related to uh, rape or other types of abuse. And the very small number are due to uh health issues of the mother, and very few are due to, those are, those are special cases, and they can be dealt with differently, but overwhelmingly abortions are due to unprotected sex or uncontrolled sexual activities. The physical is devastating, and it involves a large part of humanity is being impacted in a terribly, terrible ways, and most of these physical harms, the flip side of it is the emotional consequences, and it's the emotional consequences actually have even more impact 
that affect people's whole, for the rest of their life, they remember and are wounded by those things. Well, that's something I'm interested in. As a psychiatrist, I mean, the, the physical harms of no sexual restraint are devastating enough, but what are some of the emotional effects of no sexual restraint, a culture unrestrained? So the first, the first and most obvious emotional uh, harm is that when there is physical harm, there's subsequent emotional harm. So the people who uh, are using <laughs> porn or have a porn addiction, that's going to have huge impact on their emotional state and their relationships. The same thing with STDs. If you learn that you have an STD that's incurable, they've looked at it, uh, the rates of depression of people who have STDs that are incurable, they have really serious emotional issues. And then the fear that they could transmit their disease to a loved one or to a child has huge, huge emotional consequences. If you've been exposed to violence or abuse, that's, that's lifetime wounding that needs healing. Apart from uh, healing, it's, it, it's a lifetime nightmare for people to remember. Slavery and bondage has so much, um, so much emotional damage that's similar to the violence, but just the idea of being used and abused is, has huge emotional consequences. And then abortion clearly has major emotional regret and emotional uh, turmoil associated with, with abortion. So... Just the physical stuff has a the flip side of it has an emotional level, but on top of the emotional, we have loneliness and rejection. As a psychiatrist, I have women come in many times, and they tell me that there's not a day that goes by that they don't think about mm. the child that they aborted in their youth. Mm. It's devastating to carry that around. It's, it's got to be awful. Yeah. All these people who have had physical harm, they all need healing. And so who's going to heal them? Well, number one, we need millions of counselors who, who can point them to Jesus because he can heal them. And there's healing in Christ. Uh, and the, sh the shame and the guilt and the, just the memory of being used or abused, it's, it's very urgent that we attend to their needs. Abortion statistics are not included in the statistics of leading causes of death, but uh, there are about 50 million abortions per year globally, and that greatly exceeds all of the top 10 leading causes of death in the world combined. Wow. In other words, abortion is the, by far, the leading cause of death in the world by a long shot. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, what are some of the other emotional effects? As people start to use each other as objects, they develop not an extreme sense of loneliness. If they're using porn, all they have is their screen. They don't have a human being to relate to. If they're promiscuous, they, you know, there's just this emptiness that comes after, afterward uh, where people get up and leave. That's devastating. Because people are promiscuous, everybody's experiencing rejection. Rejection is, has huge emotional impacts on people's self-image and on their ability to cope with stress. We don't have numbers for how many people are lonely, but it's considered much higher. It's growing rapidly. There is a pandemic of loneliness globally associated with the sexual revolution. Rejection, we have, uh, I think you probably, uh, Garrett, talked to a lot of people who are suffering from rejection. Absolutely. Dr. Sanford, you were telling us about some of these um, emotional effects and you know I have to deal with things like suicide mm. uh, on a daily basis uh, do you think that this is uh, you know th these are contributors so suicide is you can't just say that suicide is due to the sexual holocaust but the things that most contribute to suicide include loneliness rejection and depression the sexual holocaust is creating a pandemic of loneliness, rejection, and depression. So obviously, it's a major factor in suicide. Well, that's some of the emotional effects of a culture without sexual restraint. Uh, we know that the Bible talks about the best expression of our sexuality is in a covenant marriage. Mm. But what are some of the socially 
destabilizing ramifications of a lack of sexual restraint. As we look at these different types of harm, what we see is they, um, they combine to magnify the harm. Socially, we see a dramatic breakdown of marriage and a dramatic breakdown of family, and it's happening globally. And it's probably most acute in uh, Japan, where uh, literally the population has stopped getting married and having families. Japan is famous for excessive pornography. Most used pornographic terms is a Japanese term. They will experience uh, implosion of their population. So they're already, they have a, sh a shrinking population. Without marriage and babies, they will soon be mostly senior citizens, and they will not be economically viable. Certainly they won't be emotionally viable because a large fraction of the Japanese have turned away from personal relationships. That reduces, by the way, STDs, but instead choose to interact with screens. And that is not only bad for society, but obviously bad for all those souls who have chosen images rather than relationships. Wow. What you're saying is that they're not learning the skills of building real relationships in the real world. They're trading that for these virtual interactions, and they're just left ill-equipped to make real bonds with others. I think that's what's happening, and it's tragic because it leaves them totally alone and totally with nothing but this nasty image that's always haunting them. It's, it's just so tragic. It's not about condemning those people, it's about trying to rescue them. The reason we're talking about sexual holocaust isn't to point fingers at people or to point blame, but rather to rescue billions of people who have been, are being devastated by, by this unconstrained sexuality. What would you tell someone that's listening now that, that's stuck in this? They, you know, what, what would you say? Well, you're, sp you're supposed to tell me that. <laughs> you're the psychiatrist, I think. And you're, um, Scott, you're the, you're the pastor. So I, I, I defer to you. If you're... I'm all ears with you guys, though, too. As the pastor, I can say this is probably one of the most common conversations mm. I have with people. Wow. Uh, that they are just absolutely torn up over their addiction to sexual sin or uh, haunted by misdeeds and by abortions or things in the past. Right. I see what you say here, borne out in my job, as I'm sure you do in yours, Garrett, as a psychiatrist as well, very, very clearly. Mm. Very clearly. And what you're talking about, the socially destabilizing, uh, destabilizing ramifications, breakdown of family, that, that's huge. I mean, that, if you go back to creation, is the foundation of society. The very first thing God created in terms of re human relationships is a marriage. He said everything was good. He created man and woman. He gave them together. And he said, all right, I've created a family. I've created a marriage. This is now very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, the marriage is the culmination, right. a family of culmination of, of his good creation. And this, uh, the, the sexual Holocaust completely undermines it. Uh, everything from things that we think would improve, like cohabitation. You hear this all the time. Well, you know, you got to try them out. Try before you buy. You know, if we live together, it'll be mm -hmm. better. Uh, no, actually, the stats are showing just the opposite. Those who cohabit have a higher rate of divorce than mm. those who don't, not to mention just the, the extra ramifications of that early promiscuity. Um, I'm seeing the same thing in my practice. People come in, the, let's say a woman comes in, hey, I'm a modern, liberated, mm. sexually liberated woman. I can sleep with whoever I want. Well, okay, that is that is one worldview, that's one paradigm. And you can live out your life like that. You can, your behaviors can emanate from that decision. There, there's no laws in this country that will prevent you from that. But then the very next thing, they're telling me about all the drama from the men that they're sleeping with in their lives. They're telling me about uh, you know, the uh, scare of pregnancy or the STDs. Uh, and, and same for the guys. They're, they're telling me about uh, I can sleep with, with whoever I want or they're addicted to pornography, and they're telling me about the devastation in their lives. And, you know, then I will get someone that comes along and say, has a belief that says, well, you know, I believe that there is a sanctity of sex, that it is best expressed in a covenant marriage between a man and a woman. And, you know, they're, they're not having sex before mar marriage, 
And they don't worry about STDs. They don't worry about unwanted pregnancies. There's no drama. You know, they're, they're sad when they break up with someone, uh, but they're, they're not devastated. Like I see people completely torn apart. And this has to be more than an exchange of biological fluids when you see this level of devastation of the person. I, I'd like to just add to what you both just said is there's not a simple fix. Mm-mm. There's no silver bullet. I think if we had it by now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so so I, I really believe because as more and more people start to see the scope of the damage yeah. and the, how devastating this is to a huge part of humanity, we need to get counselors and psychiatrists and uh, we need to get pastors and we need to get uh, people like me who are more science oriented. Or in the, We have to pull together all of our resources to try to understand how to deal with this. But more importantly, we need prayer. We can't fix this. This is a God thing. Only God can fix this. We do need all those practical things like counseling and advice and training kids to be careful and use caution and all that. But really, this is a spiritual. And actually, we're about to go spiritual to the last thing. But before we do, I want to just say, those of us who see that this is devastating to humanity and we see it devastating people in our own lives, just all around us, people are being destroyed by this, you'd think, well, let's just come together and make this right. But the problem is that the social institutions, such as the media, the entertainment world, educational systems, and the government, are all promoting with all their might anything goes sexuality. And and they're saying, don't let anything get in the way of your sexual pleasure. Those institutions should be warning children, warning everybody that this is this is an invitation to disaster. It's going to ruin your life. Instead, they're saying, hooray for anything goes sexuality and do whatever you please. Somehow, we need to call the media to account because obviously, especially in the entertainment media, they're raking in unbelievable amounts of money, just like phenomenal. But And they use it to just create more evil. Those institutions need to be asked to stop promoting anything about sexuality and start promoting caution, responsibility, and healing. That would take a revolution. It would be a social revolution. And so nothing less than a a spiritual revival, and that's where we're going next. Only a spiritual revival, by God's grace, can we turn this global crisis around. Because mm-hmm. while they're they're free to do anything, and the sexual holocaust is all about, well, I'm free to do whatever I want. Yeah, you are, but this world uh, is built on cause and effect, and mm-hmm. you reap what you sow. Uh, that's how God has designed this thing to generally work. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, I, I think salvation's excluded. That's not something we work for. Mm-hmm. That's a free gift. Yeah. But the way God has set this world up to work is, is you reap what you sow. There's cause and effect. And my heart breaks for these people who say, I am free to do anything I want. Yes, but you're not free of the consequences of your choices. And what I just see here in this, this list in this book that you've written called The Sexual Holocaust is just a, a litany of deep, damaging, serious consequences mm-hmm. on humans. Yeah. And their their selves, their emotional state, society at large. And then obviously this has an imp- has to have an impact on their soul, right? I mean, humans are not just physical beings, which is this one of the great lies of of this movement is well, you're nothing but atoms, and this is just a biological act. Right. And Christians go, no, God says this is much more. This is somehow a union of two people, of souls, not just of flesh. What are some of the spiritual impacts that your research has shown to have? I think the spiritual impact is in part that what I call the new uh, fluid spirituality is that people want to substitute a loving God who determines what's right and what's wrong with a kind of a pantheistic God who is some vague, faraway thing that doesn't care what you do or what you, how you behave. And so I think that this new spirituality, which is very shallow, it doesn't bring salvation, it doesn't bring healing, is part driving a lot of this, is you know, do what you want to do and identify yourself the way you want to be identified. Identity is a big part of this, and I would like to suggest that as I, you know, just kind of as an old guy reflecting upon what I've learned over my life, uh, there's different types of identity. There are vain identities, like I have, I have the coolest clothes of anybody I know. 
I have the biggest nose ring in the world, or or just I have a tattoo, or I'm famous for eating the most hot dogs in my, you know, just ridiculous things. But people are so desperate to make themselves different from just mm-hmm. one more little ant in the anthill that they're seeking uh, vain identities or they're seeking false identities. Like if I tell you uh, my true identities, I am actually uh, a falcon. Uh, you you might uh, question that, but you but in this culture right now, they'd say, "Well, I affirm you as a falcon." And no, that's the, the, and so. You can have a surgery to become more of a falcon. <laughs> so there are things that are false that we we should not affirm because either it's uh, someone's just playing games with their with truth, or they're actually suffering from some type of delusion, and the delusion shouldn't be embraced or affirmed. They should be healed. Everyone needs an identity. I believe our true identity is that we are made in the image of God and that God wants us to be his children. That's our true identity. That lasts forever. And any human being on the planet can have that identity. It's neither false nor vain. It's just something, an adjustment that I think has to be part of the counseling process is, hey, you're not just an animal. And by the way, uh, your identity, you don't choose your identity, God gives you an identity. The next thing is guilt and shame. A lot of the people who are suffering from the sexual holocaust have a lot of guilt and shame. For those people who are, have guilt and shame because of something done to them, they need healing, which only God can give. And for those who have guilt and shame because they've done evil things and are still doing evil things, heaven help them if they no longer have guilt and shame because to be shameless is the worst possible situation because you can't repent of your sin and be forgiven. So the guilt and shame is a big issue. We have to deal with it carefully depending whether you're talking about a victim or a victimizer. Mm -hmm. The most tragic thing of this is the loss of true love. True love is sacrificial and the true love is in the boundaries of God's desire for us. When we lose true love, we become like animals. We're not animals, but when we reject our position as made in the image of God, we can lose true love and only have this vain thing that's called sex. Right, because true love is selfless, selfless. at its core. And, and, and actually, this whole movement, the sexual holocaust— sexual is all about selfishness. It's all about selfishness, and the, this new fluid spirituality that goes with it is all about selfishness. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm the center of the universe. God is in me. Right. I'm empowered. I'm, I'm me, 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 I. There are eternal consequences. Of all the tragedies that we've outlined— the greatest tragedy is that many souls are trading sensual pleasure for uh, eternal life with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And there's no way to measure that. It's just, it tops everything. I mean, we have all these horrible things happening, and then we have that. This whole, our booklet is tragic, it's sad, it makes us want to cry. We don't delight in it. We don't want to get any type of credit for it. We just feel... You know, in Ezekiel 33, God speaks to Ezekiel and says, you're going to be my watchman on the wall. When you see danger coming, when you see destruction coming, you must warn the people. And many of them will not listen to you, but you must warn them. If you don't warn them, their blood is in your head, and you will lose your own salvation as well as theirs. As I was struggling with this issue and trying to think about what my responsibility was to react to it, that that verse that chapter uh, just haunts me. And I go, I have to sound the alarm even if no one cares. But I think a lot of people will care. If you're just tuning in, uh, joining International Gathering, a radio show, we're uh, talking with special guest Dr. John Sanford, the author of The Sexual Holocaust. And we're talking about how uh, our culture has just uh, adopted an everything goes type of sexuality and how that has uh, had major ramifications for them physically, emotionally, uh, for us socially, as well as spiritually. And one of the things that when you're talking about, like this vague spiritualism that seems to go with it, they'll often use some of the same words we use, but in the wrong mm-hmm. order. Uh, one that I think of is uh, God is love, First mm-hmm. John 4. But for these people, no, it's flipped. It's love is God. Mm. Love has become God, and I get to define what love is. Mm -hmm. Love is what I think it is, as opposed to God being the source 
and, and center of love. I, I think that's right on. I just want to make one correction. Uh, Bridget is the primary author. So oh, she, I apologize. One of the co-authors, so yes. I'm, I'm a co-author. She did uh, 99% of the research. And, we'll thank and, her for us. Yeah, and so she shares the same concerns. Mm. And she's. Um, it, it was not fun writing this book or researching this book. And I just am so grateful for her commitment to trying to expose the... This tragic, incredible, State. yeah, this yeah. incredible humanitarian crisis, yeah. and she has uh, bravely um, co-authored this book with me. Well, Bridget, we are very grateful for you uh, wherever you are and listening to this. Mm. Uh, John, is, what does the Bible say about this humanitarian uh, crisis? How does the Bible speak to this sexual holocaust that we are experiencing a new levels? right now yeah during the time that i've been you know agonizing over this issue i've been reading chapters from revelation so i'm really struck by the chapters uh, 17 and 18 of the book of revelation which is about describing babylon the mother of prostitutes and this what appears to be a global city or civilization a global culture of, uh, of sexual license and violence and, um, and evil. And it seems, I encourage people to look at uh, those two chapters, 17 and 18, uh, as a warning to us in this present time. And um, in, at the, in the beginning of chapter 18, uh, St. Uh, Saint John, the Apostle John, um, Here's a voice from heaven, which come, which is, and the voice from heaven says, "Come out of her, my people, lest you suffer in her torment." And so then, and then the next thing that happens is the utter and complete destruction of, of Babylon, the culture. And so, uh, I think all Christians should be thinking, "What does it mean to come out of Babylon?" Uh, it's, it's really um, something for. To, people to carefully reflect upon. Mm -hmm. So just for this simpleton, uh, if I'm caught up in this new spirituality that mm -hmm. you're talking about, uh, would it be fair to say a litmus test is if, if I'm not hearing that what I'm doing is sin and w the, the bad thing, the things that I'm doing that hurt others are requiring repentance, is it fair to say I'm, I'm caught up in this kind of new spirituality that you're speaking of? Yeah, I think that uh, a key element of the new spirituality is we decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. We kind of design our own God and our own religion, so it's man-centered. It's me-centered. And so if, if something brings us, uh, let's say, uh, sensual pleasure, we can say, well, that's good because... Um, because I'm, you know, I have the right to pursue happiness. What they don't realize is that doesn't bring happiness, and more importantly, it's uh, it's self-centered. You, you, it's not good to make yourself the center, because that means you're worshiping yourself. You're wow. And you know, a friend. I'm wondering, Pastor Custer, maybe you can shed light on this, because I liked what you said about God is love, and we need to respect who God is in his nature, uh, a navigator, just last night that I was talking to, Justin, was explaining to me, I thought uh, very well, he said, on the one side is the law, on the other side is law, is love, and in the middle is liberty. Um, hmm. is, is that similar? Is that understanding or is that... I don't know if I would put love opposite law because okay. I think God in his love gave us the law. Okay. I, I think I would put on one side law and I would put on the other side license or um, uh, licentiousness, which uh, that's a, one of those old, old mm. words, but it, it just means a restraint that leads toward pain and negative uh, things. Anyways, it, it's or maybe kind of antinomianism, like a... Yeah, big uh, words. Okay. Anti-law. Uh, no, yeah, a lawlessness, right? Okay. So if on one side we have law, maybe on the other side is lawlessness. Okay. And on the middle we have liberty. And I think that is where mm. you find love most clearly demonstrated. God, in his love, gave his people the law to show them the right way to live. Now... 
the Apostle Paul argues that we took that law and tried to turn it into, uh, instead of it being train tracks for us to run our lives on to show us the right way to live, we stood it up and said, well, this is now a ladder. I'm going to climb my way to heaven with this. Mm. And Paul says, no, no, the purpose of the law is not that. If you do that, all of us fall, you know, fall short. It, no, nobody can get there. It, that law cannot save. It can only condemn. So mm. we need to be saved. We need to be mm. rescued. And only once we are rescued from the law, not by God nullifying it, but by Jesus coming, fulfilling the law, by him being perfect in our place, right? If we do turn that thing up on a ladder, Jesus is the only one that can get from here all the way up there. He is perfect in our place. And now that he has freed us, we are free. Those who he set free are free indeed. But the Bible also says, but hey, those of you who are free, don't, don't use your freedom as a your liberty as a license to sin why would you go back into this you know sometimes i i i know so many christians uh, probably just because they're more willing to talk to me i probably talk about more christian men about this topic uh, of sexuality and, and porn and they they're christians they know they know this is terrible for them they know this is ruining their souls and their marriages and their views of women but they just have this hard time i think for spiritual reasons but also physiological reasons for addiction reasons there's it's not just a hey my friend here take this verse and be better Ah, man jesus has to free you from this Uh, and it that is a repentance of constantly calling out asking him for help making good decisions maybe getting rid of your smartphone you know there there are things that i think we can do but ultimately, it's going to be the work of God who says, hey, I will give you a new heart. I will take that heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. That's the only kind that can love God, that can love people, that can be less self-seeking. I think C.S. Lewis describes sin as just the self turned in on itself. Hmm. This sexual holocaust is the natural outworking of the self turned in on itself. Hmm. Going, well, all that matters is me and my desires and what I want and what I get out of it. That's what this is about. And the Bible gives us saying, no, 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 that's actually not good for you. And Jesus gives us the exact opposite ethic that actually leads to fulfillment and joy, which is to love God first mm. and to love our neighbor as ourself, to put ourselves third in line, not mm. first, as you said, Dr. Sanford. And wow. So I, I think Mind that's kind up. of a yeah. an overall big framework. Yes, it needs repentance. We need to admit our sexual sin, that every single one of us is sexually broken. We all have dark hearts. Uh, we constantly pray and ask for help. And we make decisions and we seek to live in the power of the Holy Spirit to mm-hmm. live in the ways that are beneficial and mm-hmm. good for us, which are loving God and loving others and not seeking to gratify the self, which mind officially blown. <laughs> uh, I don't always, know about that. You always impress me. I always learn something new about the Bible. You're a great biblical expositor. Well, you're very kind. You're very kind. Are there any other things, Dr. Sanford, you would add? I know I just maybe gave a little bit of my view of what I try and encourage people to do who are are caught up in the sexual holocaust. What are some closing instructions or comments that you might offer to somebody listening to this? Okay, so um, if I could just close with a few uh, thoughts. Uh, I think we all need to, everyone who realizes what's happening, needs to, number one, protect themselves from what they're exposed to, from what they're thinking, from, uh, f- uh, and from uh, any type of temptation that's inappropriate. And um, basically, we have to encourage that for our children. We need to protect our children because they are very much at risk. And we think, oh, they're just a kid. They wouldn't be affected by this. It mm-hmm. impacts. It's totally mm-hmm. incorrect. Uh, so we need to uh, lovingly um, encourage people we know to protect themselves, protect their children. Mm-hmm. Uh, thirdly, I think we need to have compassion mm-hmm. uh, rather than uh, blame. There's le- enough blame to go around. And um, so uh, we need to encourage those people who are addicted or who are have been abused to, to seek counsel mm-hmm. um, and support. I think that uh, we need to really put pressure on the social institutions such as entertainment, education, and government to stop promoting anything goes sexuality, which is the heart of the sexual holocaust. 
and start teaching responsibility and caution and the, which is which God outla- as God uh, has outlined for us um, and so these are these are th- uh, things that you know when people say what can I do to help or how can I help the situation those are some of the most obvious things mm-hmm. but the, the lastly I would like to see a um, people who are knowledgeable about the physical harm, other people who are knowledgeable about the emotional, like psychiatrists like yourself, people who are knowledgeable about the social institutions, uh, and people who are knowledgeable about the spiritual dimension, um, to actually work as a team to develop, a, um, by God's grace, by God's, by, by God's grace and by God's uh, provision, that we would come together so that godly leaders could um, make, you know, work to, to help relieve this, this crisis. So we Amen. need godly leaders, mm-hmm. and um, that means you too. It starts with us, uh, and, and, but eventually we want to reach um, Franklin Graham and, uh, you know, just the, the big names, because that, that does help. But, but it starts with just us. Sure. And um, I do think we should be calling on people of influence to uh, to to speak to this. Mm-hmm. For example, we're in election year now, and I'm personally an independent. I'm not interested. I don't put my hope in the Democrats or Republicans, but I would like to call all politicians to address this issue, which mm-hmm. is the most important issue the world faces, the most important issue our country faces. It's devastating us uh, on a most ma- amazing degree uh, every every honest politician should say yeah we need sexual restraint we need to become responsible we need to protect our children and so in the end we need to um, we do need to reach the, the people who control the institutions which control people's minds well dr. Sanford thank you so very much for your time uh, thank you for your investment in uh, the world and the benefit of others and in, into human flourishing that uh, you and Bridget Heap would take the time to research and write uh, this mm-hmm. book, Sexual Holocaust. If you're uh, just listening to this, I encourage you to pick it up. You, you can order it online, uh, but there is also a free uh, PDF of the book available, I think, on your website. Is that correct? Yeah, F- FMS Foundation, or actually FMSfound.org is the website. It's Feed My Sheep Foundation, right. and uh, basically, uh, you can download a synopsis for those of you who don't want to read the whole thing, but just a, a overview. And you can download the book itself free as a PDF, or you can order the book, which is uh, eight dollars. So, right. what, but I, we're not trying to sell books. No, and so we're this totally, is absolutely worth to, the to, investment, though. <laughs> but yeah, but especially for people of influence and for parents, they need to um, one way or another. Uh, understand this issue. There are other people out there doing good work. Uh, enough is enough. Fight the new drug. Um, there's something. Uh, so uh, Josh McDowell's website is amazing. So we're just contributing to this. There, there is a network of people who are who are realize this is catastrophic, and they're actually doing something to to reverse it. Amen. Well, we appreciate you being one of those voices as well, educating us and those who are listening uh, more about the the sexual holocaust and Mm -hmm. how it uh, really does damage to the image of God Mm -hmm. that he has put inside of us and the human flourishing that God wants us to experience, the Mm -hmm. the life that he intends for us to live. We ultimately know that can only be Mm -hmm. found in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we we pray and we ask that you will change hearts, Mm -hmm. that you will rescue us from the power of of sin. I pray for anybody to listen to this, God, who is caught in bondage of the sexual holocaust. Lord, mm-hmm. they need your recognition of their state. And Lord, they need your forgiveness for their sins. And they need your empowerment to be able to live a different life. I ask that they'd reach out to you and that you would provide those things for them. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you again, Dr. Howig and Dr. Sanford, for joining us today. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on International Gathering.